from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We'll start, as we always do, with the markets. We turn to Abigail Doolittle. So I took a look at it, maybe up a little bit, but sort of mezza mezza, not a lot of movement, it looked like. Yeah, a little bit of a, a dull summer day, what people associate with summer trading for stocks, David. Uh, at the open, stocks had been down slightly, now up a little bit, trading mix. So yeah, looking for some direction. We may get that later this week when we have jobless claims. Folks will be looking to see whether or not uh, they move in the wrong direction again. And then, of course, the payrolls report on Friday. But today, again, very, very small moves. And yesterday, two of the big stocks that had been up, Microsoft and Apple. Today, Microsoft is lower. Perhaps some folks reconsidering what uh, a potential TikTok deal would mean, or maybe just too far, too fast. Actually, more than 5%. Surging on the day, gold, uh, David, is not gold, but silver. Our old friend silver is up 4% on the day. And Apple, up five days in a row, up about 15% over that time period, David. The best five days, if you can believe it, since 2006. So that's how much the tech bulls want in on Apple after they put up that strong June quarter, David. Yeah, at the same time, it looks like we're buying bonds a little bit today. Yeah, there is a bit of a haven bid there, and that tells you when you have stocks higher and bonds higher at the same time, not everybody is believing it. That probably points to that jobs data later this week. What will it tell us about the economy? Plus, will we get a stimulus deal done? Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, the saga in Washington continues over a possible next round of fiscal stimulus, with Republicans and Democrats saying that may, they may be moving closer on some issues, but maybe not so close on others. Welcome now, Senator Rick Scott. He's Republican of Florida for the latest. Senator, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate your time. Give us your sense of where the negotiation is right now, and maybe most important, what's the biggest ga chasm between the two sides? Well, here, here's what's frustrating is we know we need to take care, and I want to take care of the people who have lost their jobs. Um, we know we need to take care of our small businesses and reopen our economy. And what Schumer and Pelosi are talking about is election reform, um, you know, postal service. You know, these are issues that we should talk about, but this is trying to get our economy open and take care of COVID. So it's, it's and, and last week it was so frustrating because we weren't done. We knew the existing unemployment system, uh, the, the additional money that uh, we put up was going to expire. We had a bill. Martha McSally had a bill, and Schumer blocked it. I mean, it's it's like they're being disingenuous. They say, oh, we care, but they don't really. And what I'm concerned about is the unbelievable dollars that we're spending. Uh, we're going to have, what, about $27 trillion worth of debt, at least by the end of the year. Our Federal Reserve, just to keep interest rates down, has bought about 60% of our net treasury issuances this year. Gold to record prices. I think the market's telling us to watch out. We got a lot of debt. You got to be careful how you're spending your money. And up here, nobody cares. It's it's like spend, spend, spend. And then our states are saying, oh, we haven't been able to balance our budget. Maybe we can use the coronavirus as an excuse to get some money out of the federal government so we can put the money down on our pensions pay for our excesses, which means that if you're a Florida taxpayer and you said, I, boy, I got out of Cuomo's New York because the taxes are so high, then Cuomo's come back and said, no, 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 I want money out of the federal government. Well, that means Florida taxpayers, every taxpayer is going to be paying for this. So I think we've got to be take care of the unemployed, help our small businesses, get our economy reopened. We need to have liability protection and then don't waste your money. Watch every dollar and hold China accountable. I mean, this is caused by Communist China. It's run by, as you know, the Communist Party of China. And whether it's not allowing TikTok to be used here or holding them accountable for all of our costs or, right. you know, holding them accountable because they're taking away the basic rights of Hong Kong citizens or putting a million people in prison for their religion, we've got to keep holding them accountable for, for their bad acts. So as you suggest, Senator, there's a lot of money we're talking about. There are a lot of zeros after the numbers as a practical matter. One of the biggest uh, gaps, it seems to me, is that assistance to the states. It looks to me like the Republicans and Democrats basically agree there should be some help for the schools to get the schools reopened, but for state assistance generally. Why is it the Republicans feel so strongly? Why do the Democrats? We all agree the states are hurt in part by the pandemic, don't we? Well, I, I think we all understand that we should help our states, and we did. We, we gave them over we gave state and locals over 500 billion dollars and we gave them loan access to another 500 billion dollars so we've given them a lot of money now i was a governor of florida from 2011 to 2000 through 2018 i had four hurricanes the federal government never said 
oh, Governor Scott, let me give you all the money for your costs with regard to these hurricanes. They never did that. They, they paid a portion. They helped us with sheltering. They helped us with debris pickup. But they didn't cover our lost revenues. And what these states are saying is, I thank you for the money on, uh, on the coronavirus because we're, we're paying, federal taxpayers are paying 100% of it. But we want you to take care of our unfunded pension plans. We want to take care of, oh, New York sold some, some um, climate change bonds. Help us with that. Help us things that we would never, never pay for. So I want to be helpful. Uh, to our state and locals for the coronavirus. I do not want to pay, uh, and I don't think Florida taxpayers should pay for uh, the excesses of New York or California or Illinois or New York who never live within their means. But, Senator, does that mean that you might be in favor of some further assistance to the states if there were strings attached to make sure it went for things specifically related to the coronavirus? Here's what we did. We did, Ron Johnson, Ted Cruz, and I did a letter to all the governors and asked them, okay, We've given you we've given you over five hundred billion dollars. You and your your cities and counties. How have you spent it? How much money do you have left? All right? And guess how many guess how many responded? Less than ten. They just want the money. And we we gave them money for Medicaid. Medicaid costs are actually down. We gave them money for their schools. Actually, school costs have been down so far. Now, we we're talking about helping our schools, you know, with money to reopen. All right. I'm all in favor of helping our schools. But shouldn't we say, tell us what your real needs are? How much of the money we've already given you have you already spent? How have you spent it? But no, they don't want to give us any information, but they want us to give them more money. That, I mean, you would never do that. You, as a person, you'd never do that. And as a business, you would never do that. Why are we doing that as government? Uh, Senator, I'm sure you've seen the reports, including on Bloomberg and other places, that the president of the United States may be considering an executive order to address some of these issues, such as un supplemental unemployment insurance, such as a moratorium on evictions. Would you be in favor? Would you encourage the president to do that if the Democrats and Republicans can't get together? I don't think it's the way government ought to work. Um, you know, we have three branches of government. We ought to make government work. Um, the, you know, look, I, I know, I know the president cares about the people that have lost their jobs. I know the president cares about reopening the economy and I'm glad he does, but we've got to force the three branches of government to do their job. Look at so many issues that we deal with right now. And it's because Congress won't act. Congress has got to start doing their job. It's, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get, you know, 60 people to agree, but that's the way it's set up. And that's what we should be doing. We've got to figure out how to work together to get good things done. And by the way, let's focus on the main event. The main event is let's make sure we get a vac vaccination. Let's make sure we get our testing done. Let's make sure we get the economy open and let's help the people that have been hurt. So as you say, but, you were governor of Florida. Let's talk about Florida specifically right now. What's going on with COVID there? And let me specifically ask about getting back to school. Where are you on that issue? Because a lot of parents around the country are very concerned about it. On the one hand, they'd like their kids to go back to school. On the other hand, they want them to be safe. Are we giving enough support to the school systems to be able to test and socially distance and really be safe in going back to school? Well, first on the test, what I was told yesterday, we're up to about a million tests, maybe a little bit less, but about a million tests a day. And we're ramping that up, uh, continue to ramp that up. And we've got to. It's going to be hard to, to whether it's businesses or schools if we don't have continue to ramp up the testing. And that's that's happening never as fast as any of us would like, but that's that's happening. I think I think on the schools, what we need to do is say, we've got to open our schools, but we got to give people choices. And that means teachers. I was talking to a teacher the other day and uh, she was told that she was gonna uh, distance learn to teach, but she had to come into the school. Well, how's that, how's that safe? And then I talked to another one that they won't tell her, are they gonna give her masks, shields, gloves, what are they gonna do? How are they gonna clean the rooms? How many kids is she gonna teach? You gotta you gotta make the teachers and all the employees there feel safe. And then give the <clears throat> excuse me, give the parents a choice. Some parents are gonna say, you know what, I'm gonna take my time. I want a good uh, distance <clears throat> distance learning program. Some are gonna say, I want my child back in school for a variety of reasons, maybe because they to get back to work. So we've we've got to give people options, but we gotta it can't be done unless it's done with information and with safety. It's got to be done safely. So, so, so Senator, um, uh, let's come back to China, which you mentioned earlier. Are you in favor of permitting uh, 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 ByteDance to sell TikTok, the U.S. operations, to Microsoft? Do you think that's a good idea? Well, I spoke to Microsoft this morning about it. And, you know, as long as we stop the uh, Chinese party's ability to surveil, absolutely, I think it makes sense. 
Um, now, I, whether it's Microsoft or somebody else, my goal is to make the ch make sure that China can't surveil on Americans. I have the same attitude about Chinese drones, uh, so that's why I'm working to make sure that you know we're not, we don't continue to buy Chinese drones uh, at the federal level and or at the state level um, to make. I mean, we we've got to understand they've decided the Communist Party of China, led by Xi, the, the Secretary General, has decided to be our adversary. We didn't decide that. We tried to make you know bring them into. Uh, the, our trade economy and all those things, they decided to take away the basic rights of Hong Kong citizens, steal our jobs, steal our technology, put a million people in prison. So I think we've got to hold them accountable. I don't believe we ought to have a human rights violator like like communists trying to hold the Olympics in 22. I think, you know, we've got to understand we are in a new Cold, cold War. When I was growing up, it was Russia. Now it's, it's communist China. Whether it's not our choice, it's their choice. Okay, th thank you so much, Senator. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Senator Rick Scott, Republican of Florida. And coming up here, would uh, President Biden be good or bad for the stock market? And how would we tell? And we ask Paul Hickey of Bespoke Investment Group. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. The United Nations chief says school closures because of the coronavirus pandemic have affected more than a billion students worldwide. It's been the biggest uh, disruption of education in history. That's according to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He's calling for the reopening of schools once the local transmission of the virus is under control. With the talks dragging on after more than a week of negotiations, the White House and congressional Democrats have offered their first hint that they're getting somewhere on a virus relief package. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin says they made a little bit of progress last night. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says they need to work together. The major sticking points concern unemployment aid and state funding. President Trump says he never met John Lewis. The president downplayed Lewis's civil rights legacy to explain why he didn't attend last week's memorial service for the longtime Georgia Democrat. In an interview with Axios on HBO, President Trump said, quote, he didn't come to my inauguration and he didn't come to my State of the Union speeches. The president added, quote, nobody has done more for black Americans than I have, end quote. Pressed on whether he found Lewis's life story and civil rights work impressive, Mr. Trump said, quote, I can't say one way or the other, end quote. Hurricane Isaias was downgraded to a tropical storm as it made landfall and moved inland over North Carolina. It's prompted tropical storm warnings all the way to Maine, including here in New York City. The storm does not pose a threat to any major oil refineries or platforms. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Well, we still have th three months to go until the election, but people on Wall Street are at least talking, beginning to talk about what a Biden presidency might look to, like and what it would do for business, particularly if it's married with a Democratic Senate at the same time. Welcome now, Paul Hickey's co-founder of Bespoke Investment Group. Paul, great to have you with us. So give us some sense in general, in history, what do Republican presidencies do, what do Democratic presidency do to the stock market? Yeah, hey, David. Uh, thanks for having me on this morning, uh, or this afternoon, I guess it is now. Um, but so, yeah, so, I mean, the conventional wisdom we all hear is that uh, over throughout history, Republicans have been better uh, for the stock market than Democrats. Uh, the Republicans have been considered the business-friendly party uh, and hence better for, the, for the, the economy and better for the market. But the reality is if you look at the actual statistics going back to 1900, uh, the stock market has actually done better under Democratic presidents than, than Republican presidents. So the annualized return of the S&P 500 under Democratic presidents is – 6.7%, and under Republicans, it's 3.5%. So it's almost a two-to-one difference there, which I think most people are surprised to see when when you look at the numbers. Um, and, you know, that's those those performance are numbers from, from a, a inauguration to inauguration. So one of the 
pushbacks we often get is, well, what if you do the returns from when they're elected? But even then, the gap isn't as wide, but it's still Democratic um, presidents uh, have had better annualized returns than Republicans. And it's not necessarily that Republic. we've had some very strong uh, stock market performance under Republicans, but uh, we've also had some very weak performance numbers, too. We had Hoover in the, you know, during the, the Depression. We had uh, the second George Bush. Uh, we had Nixon. So those were the three worst presidents uh, for the stock market, and they were all under Republican administration. So that helps to bring down the average overall. Now, now Paul, President Trump uh, likes to say he's been awfully good for the stock market. And overall, he has, has he not? But how does he compare it with some recent Democrats? Yeah, so um, so under Trump, since uh, Inauguration Day, uh, he, he, we've had an annualized return of about 9.2 uh, percent. Uh, Obama's returns were 12.1% uh, annualized. Uh, Clinton before that was 15.9% annualized. So um, it's 9.2% it's is nothing to sneeze at by any respect, but um, we have had better returns um, we, during that period. So um, if you look at the returns, again, from Election Day, it's not as uh, Trump's performance numbers look better, but um, still trails uh, Clinton by, um, you know, 15% to 16.4%. So, I, I mean, it, it's, I think the key takeaway uh, when you look at these numbers is we do focus a lot on the, uh, the performance, uh, you know, on these elections. But, um, and, you know, I like to right. use the analogy of someone trying to hold a door back uh, when, when there's a big flood coming. One person isn't going to stop the trend of the overall economy. Well, I, and, um, Sorry, go ahead. No, exactly. I was going to say, you know, uh, correlation doesn't mean causation necessarily. So the question, it could be just happening that way or there could be a reason. But is it possible that Democrats might, on average, over time do better because they just like to spend a lot more money and that typically helps the stock market? Well, I mean, yeah, so that, that's one thing you could say. I mean, we're, but we are we're definitely spending a lot of money this yeah. uh, during this period. And so over time, they, they, they found the, you know, the the division between spending has has become a little bit more mixed as both parties seem to uh, like to spend uh, show a tendency to, to spend election especially coming into an election uh, I mean, it's just interesting like I mean we look we, we, we talk about how it will Biden be bad for the stock market um, you know if he becomes elected and and one of the things we start to see is we're starting to see you know commentary saying you know maybe a Biden presidency wouldn't be bad for the stock market well that could be the worst thing you could um, hope for, because if you look back at all the past, the past four presidents beforehand, when Clinton was elected, it, you know, the widespread conventional wisdom was that he would be bad for the stock market. When uh, the second George Bush was elected, the conventional wisdom was that he would be great for the stock market. Uh, when Obama was elected, it was that he was going to be bad for the stock market. And then for Trump, I mean, the futures were crashing when it became first uh, known that uh, he was going to become elected. Uh, obviously, they rebounded quickly. So, right. but that initial conventional wisdom usually doesn't turn out to be right. Well, and particularly this year, because we have something called the coronavirus, which really changes almost everything. And just briefly here at the end, uh, what would the markets say about a Biden presidency of really dealing with the coronavirus as opposed to President Trump's? Because President Trump has not been given a lot of credit for being terribly aggressive. Right. So, I mean, it, it's it's a tough call because, uh, I mean, uh, as far as what the policy would be if he, if Biden comes in and would there be a national response and what it would be, it, it, it remains unclear. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to comment on that, but, the you know, it, it, there's a lot of unknowns out there. Um, so it, it would be hard for me to comment on that. Um, but I would just like to also point out that under Trump and Obama, the two best sectors were consumer discretionary and technology, huh. and the worst sector in both presidents has been energy. So, again, it reiterates that point that no one person um, is – strong enough to steer the entire economy. And I think that's a very good thing uh, that we should keep in mind because yeah. uh, that the alternate, if they could control things, wouldn't be very good. Okay, Paul, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. It's Paul Hickey, Bespoke Investment Group co-founder. Still ahead in this program, we are going to continue our series on back to school with the president of the University of Miami, who also happens to be a leading epidemiologist, Dr. Julio Frank. That's going to be coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour. It is Ralph Lauren, which has had a pretty rough quarter because of that pandemic. It's now going to consider yet another overhaul. And Scarlett Fu is here with the whole story. Scarlett? It's an ugly story right now, David. You look at the stock, it fell as much as 8.4%, trading at a three-month low. Bigger than expected loss in the fiscal first quarter with revenue declines across geographies, although Asia held up better than everyone else. Uh, Asia was down 34% versus down 67% in Europe and down 70 77% in North America. What was particularly devastating was wholesale revenue dropping 93% in North America. That is sales to department stores. And Citigroup says that recovery in this particular channel will be slow to come. You add it all up, that's a 66% drop in revenue. The CEO did say he expects this past quarter to be the toughest one throughout the uh, crisis. Ralph Lauren not giving any kind of full year guidance, but you can see that analysts expect the decline to kind of moderate in the next few quarters, David. So, so Scott, whenever we talk about retail, we have to talk about online sales. It doesn't look like some of those department stores are going to be coming back. There's so many in bankruptcy now. So do they have a real growth opportunity in digital? How are they doing there? Well, digital was better. Uh, it was one bright spot here for Ralph Lauren, up 13% in the quarter. But you look at what happened in North America. It was only up 3%, and that's compared with a 77% drop at physical stores. Um, so that just gives you a sense of the challenges ahead. I suppose the optimist would say there's the opportunity. But really what it comes down to is Ralph Lauren is giving us an early glimpse into the kind of damage that we might be able to expect when the retail sector really starts reporting next week. You can see that the stock has also underperformed the global luxury index as well. I would argue that it's in a tricky spot because Ralph Lauren is not a super high-end luxury play like Montclair or Prada. It's more aspirational luxury. It's also had some strategic missteps along the way, missing out on the athleisure trend. So you mentioned restructuring. That's the way out, I suppose. Uh, Ralph Lauren trying to avoid becoming the latest casualty of retail. There's been 27 retail bankruptcies so far this year. And that's we only have four and a half months uh, to go in the, in the rest of the year. So we're going to surpass, obviously, what we've seen in the past. Uh, Ralph Lauren outlining a plan to cut costs wherever it can. We're talking about organizational structure, real estate, distribution channels, product selection. David? All the likely suspects. Okay, thank you so much to Scott Fu for that report on Ralph Lauren. Coming up next, Senator Mike Braun, Republican of Indiana, gives us his solution for overcoming at least part of the impasse over the fiscal stimulus bill, and it has to do with supplemental unemployment insurance. When you're talking with Senator Braun, that's coming up next on Balance of Power. We are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we turn now to Mark Crumpton. China and the World Health Organization are in talks to trace the origins of the coronavirus after two experts from the UN agency visited the country. A foreign ministry spokesman says the discussions are focused on research related to population centers, environment, animal tracing, and transmission routes. China says a full investigation may have to wait until the pandemic is under control. Coronavirus infections have now passed the 5 million mark in Latin America, and those are only the ones officially acknowledged in a region plagued by low testing levels and uneven responses to the pandemic. Five of the 10 countries with the most COVID-19 cases are in the region, with Colombia the latest nation to join the list. In the UK, lawmakers say Hong Kong's leaders should be sanctioned for allowing what it calls excessive police violence during pro-democracy protests. A report today says humanitarian workers, including doctors and nurses, have been subjected to intimidation, threats, physical violence and arrests during months-long clashes between police and protesters that began in the city last year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Republicans and Democrats up on Capitol Hill continue to negotiate over another stimulus package and what to do in particular about those supplemental unemployment insurance payments. 
that lapsed, and they lapsed at the end of last week. Republican Senator Mike Braun of Indiana has a proposal about how they can bridge that gap, and we welcome him now back to Bloomberg. So, Senator Braun, great to have you with us. In fairness, I want to give credit where it's due. I think you also have your colleague, Ron Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson, on this bill. Yes. Explain to us how you would handle this problem. So I don't think there's any Republican that is not interested in trying to do a transition away from the $600, though, because throughout Indiana, small, medium, and large businesses, it's the biggest challenge they're facing is getting people back to work. And typically, when you're called that your job is open, you know, you can wrestle a little bit with the system, but there's a way to kind of park there, sadly. And Indiana's biggest challenge, it's an enterprising state, uh, I think handled the uh, coronavirus uh, in a way that didn't shut things down totally. Our economy is uh, really uh, coming back robustly. Getting people back to work is the issue. So uh, Ron and I had a proposal that would take it to where the maximum benefit, if a, ch a state chose to do it, could do it administratively, would be 66% of your prior wage. If not for simplicity, $200. That would make it to where people are still having an enhanced benefit. But that's the uh, probably low end of the scale. Other proposals want to be closer to where maybe the Democrats are and then phase it out. But we're so far apart in general. They've got a $3.5 trillion monstrosity that's got so many other things in there. And I think the longer we linger on that, we're keeping help to the people that need it. Plus, I found a bunch of places where small businesses, medium-sized businesses, didn't get help in the first round. I'm for covering errors and omissions, taking those individuals uh, on the lower end of the pay scale, either through unemployment or some type of help, uh, through no fault of their own, don't have their jobs, but hurry back to a healthy restart of the economy. I fear this is a prelude of what would happen if the Democrats were in charge. No discussion about how much it's going to cost. Um, I think Americans know it, but I'll say it, we're borrowing every penny of what we're doing, and we cannot replace the productive economy with the federal government. That is a uh, prescription for uh, disaster. So, so, Senator, to ask the political question, because I think it's germane, if in fact the parties can't come together with some sort of further support for the economy, doesn't that make it more likely that the Democrats might be in charge come November? Well, I think that's uh, going to depend on the American public. We as Republicans have got to articulate the story, the argument, that this was the best economy we've had in decades. I came from Main Street, building a little business into a national company. And there's no doubt about it, with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of December of 2017, rolling back silly regulations, keeping the key ones in place, that was the Trump economy. That's why we were pushing a 3% GDP growth. If we do any of this stuff that's on the platform of the Democrats, it'll be worse than the Obama. Biden economy, which was that mediocrity range of one to one and a half percent growth. You cannot get away from it, but it's hard to articulate that in the midst of a pandemic. And that's why I think it's important that we got to do two things at once. Pay attention to the rules. It's a peculiar feisty foe we're up against. But these one size fits fit all uh, blanket shutdowns. I think those economies that did it are going to have trouble getting back. And I think Democrats approach is playing into that. And sadly, a lot of it's political. So, Senator, on the Obama uh, record, because you brought that up, yeah. uh, you took the average over the eight years. But at some periods during that, they were the economy was growing much more than 1.5 percent. It was actually growing more than 4 percent, some intervals, because after all, we started at, the, at the, the beginning of a really bad recession, right? Good point. The rule of numbers, whenever you've fallen so far down, percentage increases are going to be uh, larger, just due to the arithmetic. You need to look at how you build into a recovery. That's where we were getting into a narrow range of mediocrity, and you can, can compare it and make the argument very easily that the Trump policies, especially having passed through smaller businesses, not taxed at 39.6 versus 29.6, that's been driving the economy. 
And that was after eight years of Obama when we were getting nestled in at one to one and a half. It almost doubled it. We can get back to that. Anything, I think, on this Democratic platform, front or back burner, puts a wet blanket on that economy, and that's the argument we Republicans need to make and articulate. Senator, you mentioned the resurgence in Indiana of the economy as you open back up. Let's talk about getting back to school. It's something we're covering on this program every day this week, of how we can get back to school efficiently, effectively. As I understand, a couple of, of school districts in Indiana have had to shut back down because of problems. What do you think about the going back to school issue? And specifically, are we giving enough support, particularly some of the small school districts, to really deal with what needs to be dealt with? So I think here again is a good example of enterprising, mitigating risk are hunkering down. Uh, Mitch Daniels on post-secondary college led the way on saying Purdue is going to open, we're going to do it safely. We're not going to take the easy, simple, bureaucratic approach of doing nothing. Notre Dame followed suit. I imagine all Indiana school, uh, colleges and universities will do that because you have leaders willing to take a little risk and not take the simple approach. Elementary, secondary education, I was on a school board for 10 years. And thank goodness those decisions are at the local level. And I think you need to recognize that there'll be some places that may err more on the side of safety. And I even encourage them not to do blanket shutdowns. Do not do it virtually only. But I'll grant that anything at the local level, that's where government should be most robust. That's where school policies with parents involved uh, should be at play. None of this top-down mandating how to do it. And again, being on a school board 10 years, I know that most districts know the challenges, know that they have to do things differently, err on the side of doing it, being careful, not the easy approach of hunkering down. Okay, thank you, Senator. As I say, it's such a pleasure always to have you on. That's Senator Mike Braun, Republican of Indiana. Coming up here, the head of the University of Miami, Dr. Julio Frank, takes us through what may, his approach to a safe opening of the University of Miami. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. No university president could have been fully prepared to deal for the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. But if anyone was, it was Dr. Julio Frank of the University of Miami. Dr. Frank has dealt with no less than four pandemics over his career as Mexico's Minister of Health, as a senior official at the WHO, and as dean of Harvard School of Public Health before going to Miami. Welcome now, Dr. Frank, to Bloomberg. So, Dr. Frank, thank you so much for being here. Let's start with your school now. University of Miami, as I understand, you're planning on reopening. How can you do that safely? That, that is the question. And uh, we've invested a lot of time, thoughtfulness, very careful planning. I, I try to stay away of uh, what is falsely, present, falsely presented as a dichotomous choice, either close because that's safe or, or, or open as if it was like before, which obviously would be unsafe. I think the, the real alternatives are somewhere in the middle. And, and we've tried to strike that balance, to find that sweet spot where we can actually fulfill our social mission of delivering the best quality, not just instruction, but the entire educational experience and do that and do that in a safe uh, way. And uh, so we've, uh, we've adopted what we call an adaptive and responsive strategy. Adaptive means that we are quickly uh, uh, adapting to the uh, very dynamic situation. A lot of the determinants or drivers of this pandemic are beyond our control. They have to do with governmental policy, with the way, the way people behave in the community. We don't have control of that, so we need to be adapting constantly. And it's responsive because it realizes that people have different needs and we try to respond to those. So we've offered our students First of all, a choice. Uh, those students, first of all, if any student who has a pre-existing medical condition that's a risk factor, we've told them, do not come to campus. We will give you a fantastic instruction fully online. 
And then if for whatever reason, you don't feel safe, you feel anxious, you have that option. And about a quarter of our undergraduate students indeed took that option. But three quarters were clearly telling us we can't take another semester fully online. We want to be on campus. So what we've said is you, you will be welcome here, but it's not going to look at, at all at what, like it did before the pandemic. And we call that the hybrid protected mom. Hybrid because you know we're going to have a mix of in-person but also virtual instruction. But the most important thing is protected. We are introducing physical changes and rules of behavior that are going to keep everyone safe based on the best available evidence. And we've been very clear to students, if you do not feel you can comply with these rules, don't come. If you come, you will have to, because if you don't, you will be asked to leave the campus and uh, will apply credible sanctions, but also with positive peer pressure, which we do know functions in this group. We're instituting a group of public health ambassadors, which are other students that will look after their classmates to make sure they don't incur in unhealthy behaviors. And we are also trying to inspire Young people are typically idealistic. They can make a sacrifice and do that for a larger goal, which is their education. So that's right. in, in the essence of our strategy. So, so Dr. Frank, what about it from the point of view of the administration and the instructors? Because typically universities will have some elderly instructors, maybe some people with underlying conditions. Are the instructors all willing to come back? What is the situation there? Have you polled them? Yes, and it's the same idea of being responsive. So to begin with, um, you know, about uh, actually a, a larger proportion, 30% of, of faculty members who had an underlying medical condition. We, we had a, you know, case by case analysis and where it was justified because they were at risk or they lived in a home with maybe a spouse or in the case of young faculty members, a parent uh, who was at high risk, they, they have been exempted from, from teaching. They will be able to teach online. Um, and then uh, for the rest, we have gone to extreme lengths. We have literally invested millions of dollars in creating safe environments in the classrooms, physical separations. Everyone, it's mandatory to wear a face cover indoors and outdoors. We have actually taken advantage of the weather in Miami, outdoor tents, air conditioned, but outdoors, so there's much more circulation of air. Um, the, the faculty will be provided not just with face coverings, but with face shields as well. We invested in, in microphones and sound systems so they can teach even if they have a face cover. Um, and, and it is a very thoughtful process. Uh, you know, uh, everyone, faculty and staff, will be required to do a, a daily self-assessment of symptoms. We have a robust system for testing and tracking cases. We have sufficient isolation rooms for our students. So we actually feel we can create a very safe workplace um, if, if everyone follows the rules, and we're going to make sure everyone follows the rules. At the same time, doctor, uh, none of us knows, even you with all of your experience and all your knowledge, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. Uh, what are your procedures for shutting down entirely or in part if, in fact, it, you really start to get some substantial hotspots? Absolutely. That, that's a great question. And we have a detailed protocol with exactly triggers, you know, um, threshold levels of some indicators um, that would lead us either to shut down a building, it could be a school or one of the dormitories, or even we even have contemplated the scenario, which we hope would never to have to execute, but we have the plan if we need it to uh, quarantine the entire campus, which can be done. We have, we have enough uh, capacity and we've figured out all the logistics of delivering meals to rooms, et cetera. We will, do, we will spare no effort or expense to keep everyone safe under every scenario. Because exactly, we don't know. No one can predict the future fully. We do have sophisticated models, but those are uh, forecasts, not predictions. Things can change and we gotta be ready 
to, to respond. That's part of being adapted. And, and we do have those plans with very specific criteria and protocols. And Dr. Frank, finally, because you have so much experience with pandemics, what advice, what can we learn from your approach for the entire the United States of America? Because it's pretty clear we're going to have to live with this virus for some time to come. Uh, we'd like to get a vaccine right away. I don't think we can count on that. How can we learn to live with this? What things do we need to do to change our basic behavior to at least minimize the risks to all of us? I think there are two lessons here. The first one is r really, I think, what what harmed a little bit the, the plans to reopen was thinking that these were two goals in conflict, re reactivating the economy after the hit it took because of the shutdown, because of the pandemic. I understand it was important to reactivate the economy, but it was presented as, as, as a trade-off between protecting health and reactivating the economy. And it is not a trade-off. We need to think of the two as mutually reinforcing objectives. Extending lockdown measures actually hurts the health of people, you know, both the physical health because of sedentarism, but also the mental health. Rushing to reopen not only hurts health, but also hurts the economy as we're seeing. The question is we need to really understand that those two objectives go hand in hand and that there are things that help both. Most, most importantly, testing and tracing, key. Because what you want is to get to a point where you can identify every case, trace it, and then only quarantine those positive cases and their contacts, not everyone else. That's the way we typically deal in public health. Mm -hmm. The second big thing that helps both is the mandatory use of face coverings. It was very regrettably, regrettable that that topic got politicized. It has nothing to do with, with personal freedom. I am as strong a believer in civil liberties as anyone. This, has to, this is a public health measure. It is exactly the same reason why we don't allow inebriated people to drive a car. It will protect them, but it also protects other people. It is that kind of measure, of public health measure, shouldn't be a political issue. You, it works only if everybody follows it, because by wearing a mask, I do protect right. myself, but I mostly protect you. But then I need you to protect me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's the essence of, of what I think is the lesson. Those two right. elements need to be act in conjunction. Very powerful advice. Thank you so much, doctor, for being with us. That's Dr. Julio Frank. He is president of the University of Miami. And we're going to have more on vaccine and therapy trials that's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Clinical trials are going forward with several vaccine candidates for the coronavirus. But work is also proceeding on a range of possible therapies that might not give total immunity, but could help prevent or treat the disease. Welcome now, Sam Pazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence. He is senior analyst for the healthcare industry. Sam, thanks so much for being with us. Take us through these therapies, where they are, what they would do. Yeah, hi. So um, I, I think what's interesting is that there's been so much focus on vaccines, as you rightly say, that people have forgotten that obviously folks are testing drugs for the treatment of the, vaccine, of the virus, but also they're using antibodies, which are nowadays a pretty well-trodden uh, path in terms of uh, as a therapeutic option for many diseases. A lot of autoimmune diseases and a lot of cancer uh, therapies are antibodies. So here we have companies like Eli Lilly, AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, and uh, Regeneron developing, and in pretty late-stage trials now. Lilly just announced yesterday they're doing a phase three trial in care homes um, with antibodies. So the idea is that you infuse the antibody into a patient and it protects them against an infection, that's the theory, for a length of time that depends on the antibody. So that's where we are with... Um, with, with those, there's a couple of them in phase three and a couple more that will be moving forward pretty soon from GSK and AstraZeneca. So, so Sam, one of the things, as I've told you, you taught me in your note is I thought that a therapeutic a therapy would basically just say once you have the disease, you'll get over it faster or you won't die from it. But as I understand, some of these, these cocktails, if, they, if we can call it that, of antibodies, could actually keep you from getting the disease. 
Right, exactly. So, in fact, sometimes, David, they're called um, passive vaccines as opposed to the active vaccines where you push the human body to develop an immunity by, for itself. Here you give them the immunity, if you like. Um, now, let's not I mean, they're, they're useful. You could use them in both settings. The problem as a treatment is you have to get in at the right time post an infection. And, you know, as you know, people sometimes get sick. They don't necessarily go to the doctor straight away. You know, how effective will these things be if you want to use them as a treatment? But as a prophylactic, if you can get cover for six months, like AstraZeneca thinks they can do with their antibody, or GlaxoSmithKline is working on with their antibodies, then you just give an infusion every six months, and supposedly the individual is, is, is protected against the infection, or maybe it doesn't get as bad an infection if they do get infected. Well, it's fascinating. At least there are more horses in the race than I realized. I was just watching the vaccines because there, there's other help that could be on the way. Thank you so much, Sam, for being with us. Always a pleasure. It's Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence. And tomorrow we're going to get an interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci. I'll be talking with him about everything we've just discussed. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg.